Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves to talk about money. Um, And for those watching, you can tell I am in Los Angeles, sunny, relatively unwalkable Los Angeles, um, and just really living, laughing, loving out here, getting all that vitamin D, uh, doing yoga, (laughs) drinking green juice, wearing athleisure, doing none of those things. Um, But when I came out to LA, I thought, what are the industries um, and the inherent experts that I really want to speak to? And obviously acting um, was a big one that came up and we've uh, been speaking to people about that. But another one, as I jokingly alluded to in that intro, is the fitness industry. Now, When it comes to fitness and particularly the context in which we often talk about it on TFD, we're often talking about fitness as a sort of nebulous marketing concept, which especially when it's marketed to women tends to be more about consumerism and quite frankly, the act of being thin rather than the act of being healthy in any meaningful way, let alone strong. For many women, including a very close personal friend of mine, the transition away from this nebulous and often destructive and above all kind of impossible to achieve expensive notion of wellness was better replaced by focusing on how you feel in your body, what you're capable of accomplishing with your body, and generally, I mean, let's be honest, the ability to lift heavy which we all have to do every now and again in our personal life. So I wanted to speak to someone who is familiar with these industries, who has a lot to say on this topic, but is really about that latter, more holistic and quite frankly, less expensive version of being healthy and fit. Uh, In her case, it involves quite a bit of weightlifting, which we'll get into, Um, but it's also about revolutionizing the way we think about these things, to what extent we as women feel that these things are accessible to us, and also, again, quite frankly, calling out a lot of the bullshit and misinformation and misleading imagery that's out there in this industry. So with all of that said, I'm incredibly excited to be sitting down here today with writer, weightlifter, certified personal trainer, and all-around cool person, Casey Johnston. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Here we are. In LA. (laughs) In Los Angeles. I'm new to LA, so it is also weird for me to be like, I'm in LA. You know, it's I can't even really process it sometimes. It's it's um the only, I mean, it's the degree to which I just don't think about the weather anymore is kind of shocking. And thanks to Advisor.com for supporting TFC. Advisor.com offers expert financial planning and investing for a flat annual fee. Schedule a free consultation call with Advisor.com today at Advisor.com and never make another financial decision alone. No, but it is really beautiful. And as I alluded to, um, unfortunately, and this is like, listen, I lived out here, I would be like, my number one issue is like, we got to include, like, increase the public transit, the protected bike lanes, the walkability. And it's, it's interesting to me to get on the topic of fitness, to be in a city that is so kind of superficially obsessed with this idea of being fit, being well, being, you know, in shape, all of that stuff. Um, but have a culture where, for example, like you're often having to drive to go to a gym, um, or to really make, exercise and fitness be sort of another premium lifestyle product rather than just sort of like an ambient part of your day. Right. Um, like I know many people who live here who I would describe as quite fit, um, but I don't like they, I, I think don't ever do passive exercise in their life. It's very much about like, this is a thing that I go and to some extent purchase. And I feel like that's increasingly kind of the relationship America has with Mm -hmm. fitness and wellness. And I'd really be interested to hear your perspective on that generally and also as it pertains to a place like Los Angeles. Yeah, totally. I mean, it kills me as a person to drive somewhere to go for a hike. Like in like there's a lot of hikes around here. There are there are like mountains around, which is really cool. Like where I where our house is, you can see the sort of northern LA mountains like if you go out to the nearest major street and it's like that's incredible but at the same time it feels so silly to like drive 20 minutes to go for a 20 minute hike and then drive back to my house um but yeah I think fitness as something that you purchase is kind of removing us from a relationship a more sort of what do I want to say, like a holistic relationship we could be having with it. Like I used to really like in New York that I could kind of fit together. Like I can sort of jog a few minutes to the nearest gym, 
and then do my workout and I'm like already warmed up and then I can like jog home and like that's kind of a nice like total package Mm -hmm. of doing some physical activity um but you know I think what do I want to say about this I think that we have a lot of pressure to keep up with our health like we get a lot of there's just so many like health oriented headlines where it's like you know everyone's blood pressure is up everyone's like bmi is up everyone's like eating too much sugar and like and then also the cures for all these kinds of things are always coming like really rapid fire at us all of the time and it's like so much information that we have no idea how to organize and then we're just sort of like trying to grab everyone's trying to grab on where they wherever they can And it's tough because this is a more complex subject than I think we've really given it space for, in part because we don't, we haven't known a lot about how our bodies work for a very long time. We haven't been living very long for a very long time in a way that like exercise has both been sort of removed from our personal lives, but it has never been but it's like if you want to live a long time, it's like one of the most important things you can do or, or like have a high quality of life while you're alive. Right. <laughs> so it's like that's a lot to navigate. It doesn't come naturally to us. But we've had a lot of our understanding of how all of these things fit together have been – have changed a lot. And even in the last like – even my lifetime, last like 20 or 30, 40 years. And – it's a lot for everyone to process. It's a lot for like any one person to have like a complete understanding of. So it like makes sense that people reach for the nearest like expert, especially when they're presenting like these really tightly packaged, like I understand all your problems and I can sort of like boil it all down into this one like perfect solution that's not only sounds good, but it's like easy. It's like a fit tea or like acai bowls or these kinds of things and it's um totally understandable why we've developed this relationship that feels removed because it's so complex and it's so important (laughs) but we don't have any kind of like system really for helping us manage this if that makes sense Yeah, absolutely. And we also increasingly, like, as we need more exercise in our lives to, as you're saying, like, meet this extended lifespan, we've never been more sedentary. We've Mm -hmm. never had lives that are more um, disassociated from just the passive act of, you know, having to get around to to survive. And so for you, as I mentioned in the intro, you know, weightlifting has been very transformative. You have this program that really takes people from zero, um, has them like starting by doing the gestures (laughs) of weightlifting. My friend was out here. She was like, I am just like doing curls with a broomstick in my room. Like, Mm -hmm. and it seems like, honestly, at the time I laughed, I was like, what? But she is like, weightlifting has changed her life. Um, And so obviously for you, that was a solution that was, um, that kind of encompassed a lot of different things and was very transformative. Um, But I I think in your work, you take kind of pains to be like, this isn't the only thing. Like there's, you know, there are a lot of pathways here, but why was weightlifting for you kind of the key to make a lot of these things fit together in a more effortless way? I mean, for me, I had kind of lived my life in a way that, had done a lot of destruction to my body like in a way that I didn't really realize I thought I was just like kind of living according to the rules I was listening to like you know you losing 10 percent of your body weight is a good thing eating 1200 calories a day is how you do that and doing cardio and like sort of whatever activities burn the most calories per like minute that you do because I was like I'm not exercising for a moment longer than I have to because it's miserable and it's like punishment So I'm going to do the thing that I feel like I can find that burns the most calories so I can do it for the least amount of time and like sort of just keep it in this tight little box in my life. But that led to, I mean, that was not a good pattern. It's like I can't live on 1,200 calories a day. Even if I lost some weight initially through that, it kind of led to like I never quite got to where I wanted to be. So I ended up dieting for like, I mean, dieting for like an extremely long time and always trying to get to this place of ostensible health, but never really reaching there and actually kind of getting farther and farther away from it the longer that I 
went and it felt like the more I or the longer I was doing it the more I had to do to sort of like tread water in the same place and I was just like something's not working here <laughs> like all of these things are not fitting together I felt like if I did them all I would get to a place of like eventually not having to think about it that I would just like you know not be sort of obsessing about food not being guilty not feeling guilty about working out or not working out you know as much as I possibly could and I never got there things just sort of kept getting worse so eventually I found this I mean the story is always like I found this subreddit where a woman had posted about her weightlifting experience and she had she was doing like a program that was like really pared down I had always thought weightlifting was like really complex and you had to do a lot of like different movements I mean you see guys in like their programs in the gym it'll be like 12 movements and they're doing like many sets and many reps of all this like complex arcane stuff or like workouts you see in magazines are always like very complicated and I was like weightlifting is too advanced for me I don't need anything that complicated I'm just trying to like sort of be healthy not like um be a you know super athlete or like really jacked or anything like that but then I found this woman who was doing this program that was very simple. It was like three movements a day. She was going three days a week. She was eating a lot of food and her body had changed, like sort of gotten slightly more, like we would say toned, like the the elusive toned, like she was doing it in these photos. And that to me in my headspace at the time was like so compelling and appealing. And I was like, I got to know more about this. Um, So that was what sort of, that was like my gateway into learning more about lifting. And I was like, I'm going to try this. I'm afraid if I eat the amount of food that you're supposed to eat, which is like fully twice as much as I had been eating my whole life, that I would just like suddenly gain a lot of weight. But I was like, I'm going to try it. (laughs) And if that happens, I can, you know, I can only do so, so much sort of damage in that time. But then I tried it and I was like, I love this workout the way the workouts are structured like you I was doing um three movements each workout you do three sets of five reps which is like nothing and then you do your five you do one set of five reps you sit there for a minute and then you do another five reps and you sit there for a minute and the other five reps and you kind of go like that it takes like half an hour it felt like no work at all but then I was so hungry at the end of that workout Mm. and I was like something's happening here that is you know, these pieces are kind of fitting together in a way that they never did with trying to burn calories and trying to eat less and less. And like, you know, the idea of not wasting a workout by eating afterward was like a concept that was that made total sense to me. I think I still know people who think that way. Weightlifting like worked the opposite way. It was like you are wasting your workout if you're like breaking all your muscles down and then not giving yourself the food to build them back up. So that was what kind of did it for me. It's it, everything sort of clicked together. I really liked the workouts. I had never liked this sort of like frenetic activity type of working out. I sort of like Stockholm syndromed myself into liking running or like enough that I could get it done multiple times a week. Um, but it was never like my thing that I wanted to be doing forever for the rest of my life and lifting just clicked so much better with me um so that's like my story I had just like by all of the things that I have been doing I also just I learned depleted a lot of the muscle that I had and that was affecting me in the way that I moved it affected my metabolism it affected my like a lot of like my sort of health stats like I was not healthy but I didn't realize it because I had never sort of actually been healthy and I didn't know the difference and I wasn't super in tune with myself so lifting helped me kind of get in tune with those things but also get myself back to a baseline where I had like a functioning body like a functioning amount of like muscle mass I needed to build it back um which I had always thought dieting and health and like aesthetics and like the way people looked and getting toned and whatever was just about losing enough weight that your muscles would like all the muscle that was down there would just suddenly show through and it's like not that simple you can diet away your muscle so that you kind of never get to the point Mm. where you're looking the way that you think 
you're going to like when you see sort of like muscular looking thin people it's like you have to do a kind of very specific thing that actually kind of sucks in order to like look like those people but the ultimate point was that I needed to get my muscle back there turned out to be a way to do it and it was lifting it was like I didn't even know what I had done and then I was very lucky that I found this thing that could sort of undo what I did. <laughs> that was inspiring. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, that sounds really easy. Um, I, yes. might have, I might have around and lift a broomstick I myself. I think a lot of people don't know how easy it is. It's like, I mean, you can make it complicated, but like the whole thing about it is that it is a trajectory where, you know, it's not unlike going to school and you start with your ABCs you, and then you're, and then you read longer and longer books until you're reading like Moby Dick or whatever. It's like you don't jump in and read like, you know, Marx or something like that. You start with the little stuff. Sure. And that's true of lifting too. And you don't, and you also don't have to like inevitably go to the complicated place. You can do something like fairly basic that will, if you've gotten really off track health wise, like I did kind of like get you back to a baseline, but also just kind of maintain where you're at if you feel like you know your body works perfectly great it can kind of like help you keep that baseline of functionality as you get older as you maybe are more sedentary like as your sort of life changes it's like it can be just a nice way of staying in touch with your body and yourself and like the physical movement part of things i love that well and i also i like that you sort of touched on the fact that you know if you're someone who has got those toned, which is a word that I, I, I similarly feel a little frustrated by, um, who has that sort of toned physique, but is also very, very thin that, I mean, you're kind of getting the worst of both worlds in a sense. Cause like, you're like, I think we don't often realize how many fitness influencers, models, people who we're seeing are like, they're actually underweight. Like mm-hmm. they have very, very low body fat percentages. Right. Um, and that in order to maintain that like and you can never speculate on what someone's doing but I do think there's a whole lot of like kind of quasi gaslighting going on in terms of you know sort of acting as though you're whether it's in the form of acting as though you're you know eating more than you are or on the flip side acting as though you're working out less than you are Mm -hmm. in order to maintain a very specific aesthetic and I think especially when it comes to like we talk a lot about sort of the influencer economy and what it really takes to maintain this sort of simultaneous expertise and relatability slash accessibility. And I think a lot of what it often boils down to is just straight up not being totally honest about what it takes. Yes. Um, And I know that that's something that you've talked about, about, you know, fitness influencers definitely being at minimum misleading about sort of their... um, their own routines, but also what people can realistically expect. And I'd love to just kind of hear you talk about that a bit. I can be a pretty strident writer, but I think like in my heart of hearts, I don't like to come down like too hard on anybody. At the same time, a lot of a lot of fitness influencers out there are kind of just trying to tell people what they think they want to hear. Right. Which is an understandable impulse, but I don't think it's like a super responsible one, especially Mm -hmm. when you're you have when you're when you have so many people's ear and you have like at least a veneer of authority and power and clout and all of these things you have kind of a responsibility for what you say and that it be somewhat sort of correct like it doesn't matter if you know the algorithm loves to hear somebody you know post about the top 10 tips for weight loss and they're like you know all of this incredibly disordered stuff it's still irresponsible to do that, even if you get rewarded for it. And I think we've gotten really off track with that kind of thing, like on the internet in general. The thing that I've sort of centered or honed in on in the way of thinking about this is kind of like most people out there are either working super hard and you don't see it and you would have to sort of like replicate how hard that work is in order to kind of even get in their realm it's like when you look at a celebrity it's like they have this this is not like a incredibly unique thought but it's like they have a personal trainer they have a personal chef they have assistants to like wake them up and put them down for a nap and like all of these things and 
you're and we're just ourselves it's like we it's like literally a full-time job to be to like look like a model or like chris hemsworth or any of these things and then the other end of the spectrum is just like a lot of people are basically the genetic elite it's like even if they are maintaining an incredible physique with no drugs at all they're not comp it's not worth comparing yourself to them if they're able to look like that because of just like their biology like you're just never gonna get there so it's like you're putting yourself in such a bad position and it's like impossible to tell which of the two it is but there's also a kind of selection bias of like I wish I could see, remember where I saw this, but it was like, you know, hot people tend, oh, it's like, I think it's, I called it the swimmer's body fallacy based on some TikTok that I saw, but there's another like better term for it that I can't remember right now, but it's sort of a selection bias. It's like hot people become fitness trainers would be the sort of like summary of it. Like you don't, we, we sort of assume because somebody is a fitness trainer and they're attractive that it's kind of like they're attractive because it's a fitness trainer. It's like far more likely that they became a fitness trainer because they were already attractive and it sort of like snowballed into that because of their initial attractiveness, not because they like went through some sort of total transformation or they're like the any man who achieved their dreams. It's like that's a very compelling narrative that a lot of them will either sort of dog whistle or push out there, but it's like very rarely reality. I mean, I think I think a lot of where this gets very messy and very easy to prey upon people, especially from a financial perspective, is the just endless conflation of fitness and wellness, which is like who even the f- knows what that word means. Mm-hmm. It means nothing and everything. Um, and thinness, which... I think is fair to say like there have I think we've done enough studies now like in general the studies show that like working out is not the way to lose weight like you should really decouple those things like you can often like you know put on muscles which will add weight like you're hungrier if you're eating if you're supplying your body like you're not going to become like you're not going to become underweight which is what a lot of like these you know thin aspirational figures actually are like that shouldn't be the goal of working out. And often people find that it's counterproductive to the specific goal of weight loss. But there's still, I think, a very strong, and I think in many ways, intentional conflation of the two. Right. Well, I think I was very taken in by the sort of like, I mean, it was a very sort of popular headline style for a while that was like, exercise won't make you lose weight. And I think that put a lot of people off of the idea of exercise entirely. I mean, like, I know I fought the idea of working out like tooth and nail. So many people were like, oh, diet alone is going to get you to lose weight. And it's like, I think the problem in these things is not like whether or not exercise makes you lose weight or whether or not it's diet alone, but it's like the focus on weight loss as a goal is just like, I think we've gone completely astray. And I think- totally. Research has started to reflect this in that there are, there's like a sort of much wider range of healthy weights than Hmm. we've really understood so far. Like doctors and the medical establishment have really fixated on weight as like a health marker and BMI. But there's a very strong push now by a lot of very smart people to, a lot of people want to get rid of BMI totally. But it's also a strong argument that BMI is just like, it's not the thing to focus on, even if you want to use it as kind of a neutral tool. There's so much more that goes into the picture of health that like Mm. doctors aren't looking at and doctors are often using BMI as an excuse to not look at anything else. They're like, okay, lose weight first and then we'll talk about like whether your medical issues are because of weight or anything else. And it's sort of like if we treated any other metric like that, it would be crazy, but we have such ingrained fat phobia that we have allowed doctors in the medical establishment to default to that in a way that is harmful. And it's like, even if most cases do shake out that way, it's not a responsible way to respond to somebody's health issues to sort of say, well, you have to like take care of this first on your own. Often the like I've heard from people who say, 
their, their doctor told them to lose weight and they're like, okay, how do I do that? The doctor says, eat less. Or like they don't give them any <laughs> even information on how to do that. And, but I think for some, for those reasons, but also the fact that even if you are able to make weight loss happen or like it's something that you want to happen or that you do medically need, it's so slow and it should be slow. Like the recommended, I think this is another number that should be stuck in everyone's minds if it's not, but it's like one of the real ones that healthy weight loss should be like a pound or two a week. And there's like pretty good research that shows it's not um, easy to keep weight off if weight loss is the right thing to do at a faster rate than that Mm -hmm. so that's like if you're losing a significant amount of weight that's a that's a couple years or a few years that you might be working on this and that's if you can like really consistently maintain all of the pieces that need to go into that so for that reason i think it's just like not a great thing to focus on it's so long term when we can get so much out of these health elements of like what we eat and how we move on like a much shorter time scale like in a matter of like a few days you can feel a difference from like eating you know changing some of your eating habits or working out i mean working out is like more my realm but i really think that when people learn to like move their bodies a little bit better so many of our pains come from not moving very much or um, kind of not knowing how to move. The fact that we sort of like lurch over at the waist when we want to pick things up versus like like this over like sitting at our desks on on our computers. And I get people who ask me like, how do I fix my posture and and, um, things like that? But it's like, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't sit like this, you know, if you kind of like did the mobility work that goes into a lifting routine, let's just say, for example. Um, And I think that that is a lot kind of more straightforward, like I was saying, and simpler, and it's like not complex, and it's not some sort of like special advanced topic in having a body. But we've given it this perception, we've given people all these sort of like, we filled their heads with, you know, you can do this just through diet, you like, exercise is terrible and it's about guilt and it's about weight loss and all of these like terrible things and it's about like your gym class where the gym teacher yelled at you and it's about like your mom who was always like you know had a bad relationship with her own body and working out and we've sort of packed all of these like hang-ups into that space that it's understandable that people like sort of have a reflexive revulsion to exercise and they welcome any opportunity to not have a relationship with their bodies or with moving them. But I think that's something that we need to start driving at a little more directly, especially if it's like, I take a very flexible attitude to how people want to live their lives. It's like, if you want to live not working out, you don't like it, it's like, I think that's totally fine. If you do want to change your relationship with your body, it can happen through exercise, but it's important to kind of take it seriously in the sense of you may have a lot of kind of valid and deep-seated issues with those kinds of things. And that's like worth working through and, and taking seriously in a way that I think a lot of people are like, what's the, like, what's my problem? Why can't I just like walk into the gym? Why can't I just like sweat in front of somebody else or like move my body in this way that like involves sticking out my butt they're like what's wrong with me what's wrong with me and it's like it's not anything wrong with you it's probably something that you've been through that you didn't choose and you know what can any of us do except kind of like (laughs) trying to dig out the hole that that we've been put in you know And I'd like to take a quick pause to thank today's sponsor, Advisor.com. The TFD community loves Advisor.com, so I'm incredibly thrilled to be partnering with them this year. As you know, one of my life's passions is making financial education accessible for everyone. It shouldn't matter where you come from, what level of education you have, or what your current financial circumstances are. I'd argue that the more precarious your current situation is, the more important it is to educate yourself financially. And that includes having a professional guide you along the way to help you make the best decisions and navigate our financial systems with confidence. 
Getting to work with a living, breathing financial advisor has historically been out of reach for those with less than 250K in the bank, despite the fact that many of life's meaningful financial moments happen way before hitting that financial milestone. Robo-advisors and apps have tried to fill that gap, and while they can be helpful depending on your situation, there really is no replacement for one-on-one -on -one guidance and connections. Advisor.com provides their clients with a top-notch advising team for a fixed, flat annual fee. If you have money resolutions for 2023 and are feeling motivated to make positive changes, think of them as your financial accountability partner. Their team of advisors work for you, not commissions, and will help you to achieve your smart financial goals through planning, investing, tax strategizing, and more. As I mentioned earlier, the TFD community loves and trusts advisor.com. Schedule a free consultation with advisor.com today at advisor.com and never make another financial decision alone. Yeah, it's it's tough. And I mean, like, to be honest, and I mean, I haven't done your program, although from what I've heard from very reliable sources, it was like really not <laughs> difficult. But I will say, like, there is a reality to the idea that as much as like you alluded to earlier, like hot people become trainers and then trainers are hot people. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I think that's probably accurate. Although I will say shouts to my beloved Pilates because I don't know where you are, but like a lot of those classes, it's like 50, 60 plus year old women filling up those classes and they're fit as hell. Don't get me wrong. Like they are fit as hell, but there are a lot of people in those types of classes who are definitely like, they are clearly there to like be in a better relationship with their own body. And they're not there to like it's not a runway. Let's yeah. just put it that way. Um, and so, and there are a fair amount of exercises like that. And even if it's not like your primary thing there, are, I think it's important to seek out environments where, because don't get me wrong, like you can go to like hot girl Pilates. <laughs> I don't, I never have, but they make me upset. They stress me out. But I think it's, it depends on location. It depends on the types of exercise. Sometimes it depends on a lot of factors, even the time of day. But like, I think a lot of people, <clears throat> At, at first, we'll often go into environments where it is like a runway, mm -hmm. where people all look a certain way, and they're also very good at what they're doing, mm -hmm. which if you're not, is extremely intimidating. Um, and it also then feels like the objective now, once again, even if it's not thinness necessarily, it's hotness. Mm -hmm. It's like we've maybe gone from like having a very low BMI to like having, you know, perfect sculpted abs and like a big bubble butt and a tiny waist and like yeah. all of these other things that I think are equally difficult and unrelatable for people. Um, and obviously, yes, as I mentioned, there can be exercise environments that are more welcoming, that have people of all ages, of all sizes, et cetera. But for people who feel like the fitness world for them has always just been a fundamentally sort of hostile place do you have practical tips for getting over that in a way that doesn't involve like some people go the route of like a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer, which mm. is great, but expensive. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough. It's like if you have, if the only environments you have available to you, you've like tried it and you feel uncomfortable. It's like, that's really difficult. I think, you know, I hear from people where it's like, if you live in a small town, there's like one gym. And if the one gym is like, you know, you feel like, the owner hates you on site for whatever reason. It's like, that's very difficult to, to deal with. I don't think that's like, and that's, um, valid. I'm not, I'm not like that much of a can do girl boss where I'm like, you got to go in and like make friends with the train or the trainer Shoot or, him the in the owner face. or whatever. Like, Show him uh, boss. but I think a lot of times, so like not, I'm specifically talking about not that, but in a situation where you have just sort of like an abstract fear apprehension of, of mm -hmm. gyms or of classes or the concept of working out, again, I think it's sort of worth taking that seriously. And by that, I mean trying to break it down and giving yourself the space to sort of work on it in an open way versus kind of trying to browbeat yourself into like lots of people work out why can't I just why can't I just like do this like I should just go do it I should just go do it but it's like going to do it may be a more kind of complex process for you and like that's okay to break it down I just um in my newsletter wrote this series of three articles where I was kind of like if I were so, you know, starting at the gym for the first time ever but also I find this kind of useful just starting at a new gym which I've done a handful of times now to kind of like break it down into this process where 
I don't combine going into the new situation and accomplishing something in the same session. Mm. I will. Mm. (laughs) So the first step would be sort of like you go and you just sort of like assess the vibes. You like get on. You're almost like doing recon. You're like on another mission. You you get on a piece of equipment where you can kind of like see a lot of the gym and just like take it in and like watch what people do and like make that your sort of that's the workout in a way Mm -hmm. like you're not trying to go and like do your reps and like find all the equipment that you need and like how to use it and all these things it's like that's a lot to deal with you kind of just at first you just go and observe and then the next step is like you are doing essentially a dry run you find all the stuff that you need you figure out how to use it you kind of like get to the point where you could actually start doing your workout and then kind of go to the next thing so like in the workouts that I started doing it's like you would kind of like go to the squat rack figure out how to put the barbell on the right like remove the hooks up and down and these kinds of things and get it all ready to do your set and then like okay that's all I need to accomplish for the day and then go do the next thing and then on a sort of third session that's the time that you would actually start working out Mm -hmm. and I think this is like that kind of breakdown is a little bit more um, hospitable to the kind of hangups that people have. I don't I hate to say hangups because that sounds derogatory, but like the um, things that people that hold people back from the gym. It's like everyone's afraid of the sort of social environment. They're afraid of doing something new on their own. They're afraid of looking silly. So if we sort of like take those things one at a time, it can be a lot more manageable, Mm -hmm. I think. So that's what I would suggest. I think that can be like a much more kind of like trying to deal with the new environment of it all. I've compared it to like starting in a new school or starting a new job. It's like you don't really walk into a new job and like start doing the new job right away. It's like you have orientation and you meet your boss and you set up your desk and like kind of like a few days or a week later then you start doing your job in in earnest yeah totally I mean it's like not dissimilar from what we recommend for people financially like if you're in a total mess financially like for the first month like just don't like say you're not going to change anything like Mm -hmm. you're not going to make a budget you're not going to like you know restrict your spending in any way you're not going to change anything you're just going to track your money yeah like just like set up the app like look at your bank accounts print out some statements like just get a sense of where your money is um because a like i totally agree that like breaking it down into these like bite-sized portions is very helpful to actually finding the motivation to do it but also because like there are tons of studies that show that like as soon as people are aware of these things they and like confront them face to face they become less scary they become um, something you actually want to in the case of finances manage and improve like it just demystifies the process in a very kind of low stakes way and I think that that's you know probably a very similar um, dynamic but you know in terms of you know again when it comes to the the very aspirational image that women are sold and kind of the expectations that they're operating under. I mean, there have been a true glut of articles over the past like six months to a year of like the death of the slim, thick influencer. (laughs) She's been stoned to death in the the town square. Um, And the rise of like, you know, thin is in like it's, you know, they got that new, they're hoarding that diabetes medication. Um, all the, I'm just, listen, I'm in LA. I'm sure the vast majority of Ozempic and like whatever that other one is, the insulin medication that um, is necessary, like very helpful for people with diabetes, um, but is being taken um, by people who don't necessarily need it. This because isn't Wagovi, is it? Wagovi and Ozempic are yeah, the two yeah. big ones. Um, but they're excellent for weight loss. Um, and they have just taken a lot of like celebrities and wealthy people by storm. Um, and I, I don't know if it's like a cause or effect type of thing where like, because it was so available, now it's cool or it was just like, you know, it just happened to sort of coincide. But like, obviously the Kardashians who will pay for their sins against women's self-image, I I must be honest, in so many ways. Um, You look at, you know, other influencers, models, actresses, 
there is a very clear shift, I think, in the past year especially of what is considered aspirational for the female mm-hmm. form. Um, now, of course, all of this is bad, right? Like, it wasn't better to be like, oh, I want to look like Kim Kardashian who has, you know, a 15-inch waist and a 30-inch hip or whatever the hell was going on there. It's not better to aspire to that than it is to just be extremely thin. Obviously, they're all bad <laughs> in different ways. But I, I do think, I mean, just not even in an observational way, like as a woman moving through the world, it's very, it can be, I think, very difficult mm-hmm. to remove yourself from the notion that not only is there something that you can be aspiring to, but that the very sort of essence of the physical form you live in, if you happen to be shaped a certain way, sorry, or happen to be, um, you know, happen to look a certain way after a certain period of time or what have you, that that your very body could be out of style, mm-hmm. that the way you sort of naturally are formed could go in and out of fashion. Um, obviously, you seem like someone from the outside mm-hmm. who has formed a pretty healthy relationship with the way that your body looks and the way you feel in it. Um, and I would love thoughts that you have about kind of tuning that out both from a practical like what I'm sort of reaching toward perspective but also a how I perceive the way I look regardless of what I'm reaching for perspective right I think it was important for me to I think what lifting helped me do was shift my focus on my body away from what it looked like to how it felt to be in my body and how what it could do basically like the fact that I could go to the gym and squat you know 135 pounds was is incredibly validating it's like that's a medium amount I mean it really it's like I mean world people who hold world records squat hundreds of pounds I think well here's the thing 135 pounds sounds like a lot I think before I started lifting I would have been like I have no need of ever lifting that much. I don't really feel like I could ever do it, but it's like, it's much more achievable than people think. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think, you know, in six months, most people could lift that much with like, just kind of showing up to the gym, eating enough protein and carbs and fat. It just sort of happens in a way that's like, I can't stress enough how magical it is. And I say this, and I don't know, I like, it's hard to know how many people in raw numbers believe me, but I get these emails from people who are like, you said this and I didn't believe you, but then I did it. And like, I, now I know exactly what you mean. I wish I could, like, I had better words to express it, but it's like, this is a very central component of lifting. It's called uh, linear progression via progressive overload. And what that means is you sort of show up to the gym you lift a certain amount of weight, you go home and you eat your food and you rest. Usually you don't work out like, um, what's the word? Subsequent days, like you would not Mm -hmm. go on Monday and then on Tuesday, you kind of like take a day off, then you go back. And then you add a few pounds to what you lifted before. And you can do that every session for like months, for some people for like a year. (laughs) I think some people even longer, but it's like, to be able to do that for three months, it would be like a very straightforward thing to people for people to do. And the math works out that if you were to do that, adding, I think, five or 10 pounds per session, which is very doable for a lower body movement, because it's like these are a lot of big muscles mm-hmm. um, without either growing very much or needing to put in any like really special effort. You show up and you do your three sets of five reps in that few months you're suddenly squatting over 100 pounds it's like much easier than people think it is Mm. um and that's just it's like it's truly i'm going to say magical again it's like our bodies are meant to be able to rebuild muscle in this way that is not well understood and it's like if we bring it back to the sort of like focus on weight conversation another thing that we've like barely started to unpack is is body composition, how important like lean muscle mass is when Mm -hmm. we're looking at people's like weight and bodies and health. Lean muscle mass is very important to a number of health aspects. Right. It's like if you have kind of, um, I hate to say asleep because that's not a technical term, but if you have kind of like latent muscles or you have like depleted muscles from dieting too much, 
putting in that work to rebuild them is a very like significant thing, but it's also very, it comes naturally to human bodies in a way that is really, I mean, I was so like, I hated biology in like middle school and high school, but this has been like so compelling to me as a biological concept. I think knowing about this process really helped shift my focus to what my body could do and the way it felt to be in. The fact that I could substantially affect the way that it felt to even just like bend down to pick something up or like carry a box or carry my groceries or like move stuff around on shelves overhead or one of my classic examples is putting a suitcase in the overhead bin, which is like an impossible task for somebody who doesn't lift weights, but it's like so incredibly easy if you do even have like sort of a baseline level of um, overhead press is one of the uh, lifting movements where you're kind of learning to lift weight overhead using the right muscles. And I, I just like, I think that was the most transformational aspect Mm-mm. of learning to see my body differently and kind of pulling focus away from like, how do I look? Does it look the right way? Am I like, how do I compare to these other women? And it's not to say that those thoughts like completely disappear entirely, but having a different way of thinking about your body and a different focus is really important. And I think it also helped me on like a more minor note to um, give my try and give myself as much as I could in an environment where other people felt or thought the same way about their bodies. Like mm-hmm. I made a separate Instagram before I ever started posting to my Swole Woman Instagram. It was just like a feed of other women who did powerlifting, which is specifically the strength training sport where you, you're doing like max attempts of squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, and those women just like not in any often sort of outward facing or like really, you know, for like the the front facing communication of their social media was not like X Y Z. Your body is is about what it can do and not what it looks like. But it was like they were just out there doing it. They were like excited to eat. They were excited to train. They were excited about their accomplishments in the gym. And they were just not thinking about like, oh, what does my butt look like? Like, is my waist small enough? They were focused on like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm eating this burger because I want to hit my deadlift tomorrow. I'm like having my rest day because I had a really tough bench day yesterday. And like that was kind of their whole ecosystem. Mm. And that was very compelling to me. Just like I'm picturing just like a bunch of like (laughs) young trendy trunch bowls, just like with the like big leather belt, just like throwing the shot put and everything. Yes, exactly. I love that energy. It's very empowering. Um, So you mentioned getting enough protein, carbs, fat. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got to go there. So I feel like my... Instagram Explorer page and my TikTok feed are permanently and irrevocably damaged from researching videos that we do where we dive into specific subcultures and influencers and peddlers of all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got, I mean, it's all battling it out on that feed. Um, It's a nuclear waste zone in there. (laughs) Um, But one of the things that really stuck out to me when it comes to the fitness wellness space, um, particularly as it pertains to, to what you're eating, even leaving aside the weight loss aspect of it, which is obviously a huge selling point for a lot of it, even just like this is what your body needs, like even getting to like the real quackery of like this cures all illness and like mm-hmm. all of that. I there's like I, I there have been days where I've screenshotted the explore page because there were there were people on there who are like on the carnivore diet where they're like only eating like butter and grass fed beef and eggs and. Shit. And then there are people who are like, I'm a raw vegan lifter Mm. and they're, and I'm like, you guys gotta, like, we're putting you in a room, let you guys go a couple (laughs) rounds. Like you can't all be right. Right. Like by definition, you are, you, uh, you hold mutually exclusive beliefs and yet you're both so convincing to your audiences about like, not only does this work for me, like this is the optimal human diet. Mm -hmm. This is what you need. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about that generally, but also like how did you figure out what was what worked for you while sort of tuning out the received mm. wisdoms? I mean, if I were to have like a sort of like philosophy about it, it's almost like the more specific a solution is, the more people kind of like seize on it, like really intensely 
but we have to pay attention to the fact that it's also often for a really short period of time. It's like, think of any really specific diet you've ever heard of. It's like the more specific it was, the more of a flash in the pan it ended up being. It's like the cabbage soup what, diet, cabbage soup diet, grapefruit diet was like, I think my mom did that when I was a kid. Um, let's see. I know of like, oh, there were these like um, meal replacement shakes that I had a boyfriend once who used to take. Um, and <laughs> I mean, it sounds like slim fast for dudes. It was, it was like not far off. Um, like, I don't know. So, so it's almost like, and then some more general things, it's like keto is kind of stuck around, but keto is like kind of a little more open to interpretation. Same or like paleo. Remember paleo? Oh my God. Paleo is huge. Paleo is like still around, but it's kind of like really surged and now it's gone away. So it sort of helps to think about these things over the long term. And I think it's like, if you're younger, it's hard to feel, you know, sort of see those patterns because you haven't like been around long enough yet. Like, especially if you're, I mean, I don't know how kids experience this today. I'm like terrified to think about it, but like, you know, the diets that were around when I was a kid, it's like, you haven't lived long enough for it to like get in the rear view yet, but it's the longer you're alive, you'll see like kind of things come and go. It's like, we're already, you know, it felt like Peloton was never going to go away. And now Peloton's like the little engine that could in terms oh of God. brand and like trend. Um, but it, you can see it with fitness trends too. It's like, remember Tybo? Do you remember like P90X? Jazzer size? Like these kinds of things. Like, so the, I, that's kind of like how I think about it is like the more specific it is, the more likely it's like you got to just like, you know, not zone out, but kind of like, be zen about it and just like okay this is gonna you know maybe this is like compelling to me it feels like it has all the answers but like it will pass I had been through so much dieting stuff by the time that I came to lifting that I already had kind of a grasp of of calorie counting for sure but that was like not enough of a big picture I had to kind of get a hold of how much protein I needed and that I needed a lot more calories and then you need carbs and fats and like how do all these things fit together um and that was tough for me it was definitely a process to figure out like what you know how much what it looked like to have that much food Mm -hmm. it would be like you know I would eat a normal what was a normal to me amount of chicken for dinner let's say and it'd be like okay that's like one quarter of the amount that you need to get in this meal you need to get four times as much and it was like okay do I eat four times as much chicken that feels like a lot of chicken like I feel like I'm not doing this right if you if you need or want to go through this muscle building process it's like very worth getting getting an understanding of what a meal that's like high in protein versus low in protein like I my classic breakfast before I got started with all this would be like toast and peanut butter and everyone thinks like peanut butter is a protein food but like if you're lifting weights it's like that's not gonna cut it you're gonna have to really get a lot of protein in the rest of the day in order to kind of like make that work and it's like you can if that's your one true joy you can definitely make that happen but it really helped me to learn to kind of like put these legos together by seeing other people do it it's like made me kind of sad to see um there's been kind of a backlash against the what I eat in the day type of post. <laughs> when they're not out and out lies, which they often yes, are. Right. Let's be clear about right. that. Right. Many of them are lies and many of them are like highly stylized. Um, I, but I wish there was like a way of knowing that they weren't. It's like when I when it's somebody that I trust who does it, like there's somebody who I followed for a long time. His name is Alan Thrall. He's done a few, he, he talks a lot about what he eats and he's like a power lifter and he runs a gym in Sacramento. Um, but he kind of like backlashes fitness, fit, fit influencer trends a lot. And he's done some posts that are just like, here's my normal ass, like what I eat in a day. Like, you know, I have um, oatmeal and eggs for breakfast, like a chicken thigh and rice and spinach for lunch. And then it's just like very, it's, it's on the level of the eat this much site where it's just like this is normal food for normal people the protein thing is so real like i've been most days most i track my um macronutrients because i was like my you know sometimes you go to the doctor and you're like i'm just feeling 
not great sometimes. They're like, well, what are you eating? Because, like, you got some vitamin deficiency, you know, like that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, so I, like, wanted to be aware. And I was, like, eating what I thought was, like, pretty balanced. And, like, after a week, it was like, girl, you're eating basically no protein. Like, because you don't realize how hard it is to get enough of it mm-hmm. by the standards of, like, a relatively active life. And, like, I, like, now I'm, like, I have, like, hard-boiled eggs in my bag. Like, mm-hmm. I've just, like, become that girly. But it is, it is really shocking to truly take the time and I really would obviously if you're someone who any kind of food tracking is going to be problematic for you totally understood don't do it Mm -hmm. but it is worth really diving down into how you think that you're feeding your body versus often how you actually are Mm -hmm. and like what you might be deficient in what you may not be getting enough of and the impact like for me anyway like when I started getting when I started hitting the protein like target on my macronutrients like I felt completely different every day. I truly did. And it was like with no other change, I slept better. I had more energy. I had way fewer spikes, things like that. And it's like just from eating like more cheese sticks and shit, like it's crazy. (laughs) I think it's tough because it's hard to know how your baseline could be different if you change things like that. And I think people, there's a a lot of times like deserved apathy about like, oh, like nothing I do sort of, works and we bear a lot of like individual responsibility and guilt over these things when we don't get like a good edu- like ideally we would learn this in school or like our parents would know but our parents don't know anything this is a very like it is a fast developing area that we've learned a lot recently and everyone's just trying to keep up ideally it would not there would not be this like sort of high burden on like okay I gotta like find a resource to tell me like how much protein is in a chicken breast or like an egg and like how many eggs I need to eat and all these things that we would, we would just have like a sort of more, um, not intuitive, but like we would have a sort of body of knowledge about it that we don't have. And everyone's kind of like on their back foot trying to figure this out. So it's understandable that it's neither like an exciting thing for people to like invest their time in to be like reading these numbers. And that's like in the event that it's not totally triggering to you, but it really does make a difference and it really can sort of change things for you, especially if you've had this kind of like really alienating experience of your body where you're just like, I hate, you know, I feel, I feel kind of like nothing about myself except that I like hate how I look. Hmm. It's like, that's, I don't, I don't want that for anybody. It's like, you're entitled to have whatever relationship you want with yourself. But I think we are not super empowered to feel control over that relationship or to like change it to the extent that it is changeable but it really is i know it's like not fair as a burden but i think if more people did kind of give themselves room to learn about this stuff or like take a little bit more feel a little bit more agency about it it's like you can make a difference and it feels like eating a few cheese sticks or like some hard boiled eggs or whatever is not going to make that big of a difference. But <laughs> I hate to say it that it does. will, but like it can. It it did for me, like no joke. And I don't <laughs> say that to like make people feel guilty about like, oh, this is like another thing that I'm not doing. I know it's hard and I know it's like, it's not a delightful way to spend time. Ideally, we would like, I'm like in the vision of a perfect world, we would just have like our perfectly balanced like meal boxes of vegetables and like farm you know farm goods like show up at our door and we would have time to cook them and it would be just like that's the world that I aspire to live in so I know it's like to have to go to the grocery store and be like oh my god like which you know I don't know like frozen meal do I buy that like has the most protein you're like going and looking all the backs of them because you don't have time to cook it's like oh that's it's not fair. We shouldn't we shouldn't have to live in this world that we do live in. But to the extent that I that anyone can put effort into it, I feel like I promise it's it's worth it. It does pay off. Well, I agree. <laughs> uh, I've been inspired. I might maybe pick up a weight. Who knows? Stay wow. tuned. I don't know. Probably not. Maybe. I mean, listen, never say die. Um, Casey, it's been such a pleasure. Where can our audience go to find okay. more what you do? So um, I write a newsletter called She's a Beast. It's at she'sabeast.co online. And there is a associated Twitter account. And my Instagram is 
at swole woman spelled s-w-o-l-e woman uh my twitter is casey johnston and i don't think there's anything else that should cover it listen that is like a lot of swole resources (laughs) we they got many places points of entry here um thank you so much for being here and thanks Thank you guys so much for tuning in um, and we will see you back here next week on an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Goodbye. 